Um, welcome to the second uh, hub dev call. Um, we have a uh, we have sort of a good good uh, good good bunch of things to discuss here today. Um, here's the agenda. Um, so first of all, the overview of the informal hub team's work uh, in the past two weeks. Um, I guess uh, we actually have a update that just goes over all this stuff. So I can actually just open that. That'll be easier because it really is just from the past two weeks because um, so let's see. So yeah, we've mostly been working on um, the, uh, the 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 V. We got the V pen upgrade out that just bumps a lot of stuff, and um, it um, you know it gets all the dependencies up to the latest. Uh, I think our almost latest, basically as late as possible, uh, including Cosmos SDK, um, IBC Go, Com BFT, GoLang. Um, so this is nice. We can get everything upgraded and stuff, and then sort of. Um, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, get everything up to date and then the next, next release have some more tangible features in it. Uh, we've worked on the liquidity module removal. Um, that is, that was the work is mostly, you know, done by the Crescent developers. Um, and that's basically this thing where we got to get the money out, get it back to its owners. Um, the, um, the, uh, yeah. So the um, they have written migrations, mostly Dongsam from uh, Crescent, uh, which basically will take, I think 99% of the locked up funds are um, able to be transferred directly back to their owners. And then there's another 1%, which um, is, uh, you know, hard to attribute because it's going to module. I think we had talked about this last time already, so I'll keep it quick, but basically that 1% is going to the community pool. It looks like it's about a thousand dollars right now, I think. Oh, actually, uh, Milan, did we update that number? Because it's, it changes and, and the, the Crescent devs actually put together a, a, a whole like script to, to calculate it. Um, is it still around a thousand dollars or has it changed to something a little bit less or more? I, I didn't change it uh, recently. Uh, last time I talked to uh, Simon was that it was, it was 150K and that's what's in the proposal. Got it. Okay, cool. So the, the total amount's 150K. The stuff that has to go to the community pool is about 1% of that. So it's about $1,500, um, $1, I believe. So um, <clears throat> we've also been working on, uh, on Comet Mock. Um, and Comet Mock is like, uh, basically uh, it stubs out, it's very cool. It stubs out Comet, uh, for end to end tests. So, uh, what that does is it makes it so that the end to end tests can be deterministic and, um, it allows, um, it allows you to do stuff like, uh, telling, you know, having, having a network that's effectively a lot like a real, very close to a real uh, Cosmos network, um, and then being able to tell it stuff like, uh, and taking real transactions, everything, you know, pretty much obviously not completely accurate. You, you need to have the real thing, have full, fully accurate scenario. But what it lets you do is, is, um, do stuff like tell it to advance a block, uh, tell it that time has advanced. You can make it run really fast. You can make it run, you know, a ton of blocks in a few seconds if you want. Um, and there's still some stuff to figure out there. There are slowdowns, which still make it like, uh, they don't, they don't actually make it that much faster, um, because there's something, I think in the CLI layer that makes it slow. Um, but basically that's, that's like, um, that's hopefully going to really speed up our end to end tests and make them more deterministic as well. So it's pretty exciting. And then it will also be a good tool for any team who uses Cosmos uh, at some point we've been uh, supporting stride team. Um, so the stride team just got their governance proposals out for, um, their consumer chain and their liquidity stuff. Um, and they uh we've been uh sort of you know working this has also been ongoing obviously for several months but um we've um gotten the um the sovereign and consumer code pretty much finished up um and uda is going to be able to share more about that as well um and uh kind of gotten you know gotten things to to uh more or less finalized state there's still a little bit of work that needs to be done um in their consumer chain proposal they don't have the exact binary hash actually that doesn't create a that doesn't create an issue technically um 
but uh, yeah, so there's the, basically they need to get the V3 release of Interchain Security integrated, which contains the 47 upgrade. Um, 47 upgrade, um, thanks to uh, Notional uh, and a tiny pull request from All in Bits, um, we we upgraded to 47. Um, and uh, so that's what's going in Interchain Security V3. We've discussed that previously as well, because um, that's obviously work that's been ongoing for, for, for a couple of months. Uh, and then the uh, Interchain Security um, V2 is uh, just basically consolidating all the fixes that have taken place since um, since we launched Interchain Security. And that uh, basically is just a release. Um, so it releases, you know, there's stuff like soft opt out, some bug fixes, just various things it's, uh, getting released. It's really so main. Um, and then on top of that, we're going to be able to come pretty quickly with the with the V3 release, which contains SDK 47. Um, then we've also been working on uh, Gaia documentation. So um, I, I guess I, in Milan, you can maybe speak more to that. Um, but uh, yeah, we've been doing uh, research sessions and stuff like that. So. Sure. Um, as as you can read, uh, we, we've uh, reached out to a number of different validators: uh, Crypto Crew, Coinbase, Notional, A41, uh, a couple others, uh, just to get a sense on you know what they think of, you know of the current guide documentation, what's missing, you know different types of content. You know we could add you know, maybe different formats. So then all of these things are kind of in that uh, discussion. Um, yeah. So that's something that will uh, continue in Q2 and Q3. Uh, feedback from those sessions uh, will, you know, will go into the development, and then we'll be uh, churning out new docs as we go. Yeah, and we've got a survey. Cool. We've got a survey out mm -hmm. as well at, at the end. So if there's uh, any validators who who uh, come across uh, this link, yeah, you know, you can take a look at the survey and fill in additional details if you've got any opinions on the current docs. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, yeah. And no, Marius, if I, I don't know if I've, if I've missed anything, um, but, uh, but yeah, if there's anything you want to add? Uh, no, maybe a quick note. I added as uh, in the chat already, you can always follow our work on the project board that way it's public in, uh, I think the second tab there, it's current OKRs. And uh, yeah, we try to keep that it's quarterly. Uh, we will update it every quarter and it's basically how to yeah just check uh, in general what we are working on uh one extra thing a few of the things that Jehan mentioned especially the so ICSv2 right all the work that we did in the previous so basically since really releasing interchange security in February all that work goes in ICSv2 together with, we refactored the global fee module and also the removal of liquidity. All of this will be shipped as Gaia V11. So uh, mm -hmm. of course we mm -hmm. still have to do some testing together with Haifa. Uh, we have to wrap up some things, but mostly, and wait for, of course, for the outcome of the proposal that is on the, the hub right now. But once all of this get uh, together, we'll release V11. Cool. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Udit, you want to you want to take it over for uh, Haifa? Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, the main uh, main piece of work over the last couple of weeks for us has been working with the Stride team on their first consumer sovereign chain to consumer chain uh, transition. So basically, last Wednesday we ran at this rehearsal where we had uh, the Stride uh, folks uh, with the Stride folks we ran a sovereign testnet which basically had an independent validator set. Well, actually we had 20% overlap between the hub testnet validator set and the stride validator set on the sovereign chain. This is basically because this is the this is what we expect to happen on mainnet as well. There's a 20% overlap. Um, and then uh, the, the way the upgrade happens is there's a, there's an upgrade on the stride side and a consumer chain launch event that happens on the hub side. So standard consumer edition proposal that goes in, we export the uh, cross-chain validation state. And then in the upgrade handler on the stride side, we uh, pull in this uh, CCV state and a couple 
blocks after the upgrade happens on the stride side, we now are validating with the hub validator set. Um, so we ran this whole process on with, with the hub validators on the hub testnet um, and um, managed to check that the IBC connections uh, from the sovereign, the, the pre-transition sovereign state were maintained after um, after the um, the upgrade took place, which was which was excellent. Um, there were some minor workflow issues found, which we've been working with the Stride team to resolve. We're doing another upgrade on the 28th of January. Um, this will include um, the what what we're expecting to be the final code for Stride. Um, that will include ICS v3 that incorporates the um, SDK 47. Um, and um, one of the things we are going to try to do is to do a stronger comms push this time to get as many of the of the hubs validators participating, um, looking to ICF for support with this as well. Um, and yeah, if there are any validators here or listening to this, we'd love your support on Feb twenty uh, on uh, on the twenty eighth of uh, June. Um, and uh, other than that, today we also did the Pion One upgrade, uh, which was which is Neutron's persistent testnet uh, was upgraded as part of our weekly testnet Wednesdays program. Um, uh, and thankfully, it was successful. We were anticipating some potential issues there because there was a previously there had been some state corruption issues uh, with that testnet. Um, we are seeing some performance issues on the neutron test nets. And I think uh, Jahan is gonna talk about this a little bit more later in the call. I think we're seeing these in mainnet as well. Um, apart from this, we've also been adding, we've added the global fee testing uh, suite to our upgrade framework. Um, this is gonna be necessary for the V11 uh, upgrade that Mary's just talked about. Um, Next week, we are have already started planning a duality upgrade, which is going to happen on uh, the persistent testnet, and the second rehearsal for Stride Sovereign to Consumer. Um, that's going to happen on the twenty eighth. Um, and finally, uh, we are also working on a with the most active validators on the the testnet. We've we're working on this uh, testnet working group. Um, to basically help us ensure that we have better uptime, better uh, kind of participation on on um, Gaia test nets. Um, more information on that maybe next time. Pass it back to you. Cool. John. Nice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me grab. Uh... grabbing the, the roadmap to prepare for that. Um, sorry, sorry, very cool to call these. Um, okay, go back to sharing. Um, Uh, you guys see everything? Uh, yeah. So the um, I think the update on Stride we've we've kind of covered we've kind of covered that um, on in terms of the test nets and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, just to recap, uh, the, the props they have out which went out yesterday morning. One is the consumer chain prop, and another one is a community pool spend prop. Uh, the community pool spend prop will go into a. Um, it's going to be used to, to LP and Adam slash ST Adam pool. Um, and so in theory, it's not really like spending the money. Uh, in practice, I actually, I'm not the best informed on this stuff, to be honest, uh, on the DeFi stuff, but I'm not sure uh, whether there's potential gain from that um, or whether there's potential permanent loss. But, but I guess that's something probably that uh, we'll have to, uh, I think they might you know, they're probably written about it on the form. So 
then also the consumer chain launch proposal uh, that has a date. It is going out now, but the launch date is actually pretty far off. It's not that far off, but it's, a, you know, the 19th of July. Um, so still a month off. So there's going to be a, a few weeks, uh, two, three weeks between when the proposal is accepted, if it is accept, accepted and um, when the spawn time is. Um, and so uh, this time we're going to be a lot better about, and I think a lot of validators have learned as well, but we're going to be a lot better, but we've learned too um, how important it is. We're going to be very, very good about getting validators to uh, do their consumer key assignment. Um, that's really important um, because otherwise you end up with a situation like Neutron. Um, and then the other uh, thing is that validators will have to, in preparation for this, they're going to have to start running a stride um, full node. So once they run a stride full node, then when the whole switchover procedure happens, uh, that full node basically gets promoted to being a validator. So um, pretty simple, but it, it does need to be synced up and stuff. Um, <clears throat> so then I'll come to the, the Neutron downtime performance issue. Um, Neutron has been having um, blocks. I'm actually not sure how frequent it is. Uh, I'm not well-versed enough on the details. Maybe Milan or Marius, you guys, you guys know or someone else on the call maybe knows. Um, but basically, can, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I can explain it quite well. Uh, it's actually a very subtle thing though. SDK already fixed it in mainline, but just uh, to land up in uh, SDK 50. Uh, it's not really an issue for existing chains besides Neutron. Uh, basically, how downtime works, you write in the state a bitmap, right? So you just go and say, okay, this validator was present, was not present, present, not present. So for every block, you just add something. But it's not really a bitmap, right? It's actually you just write a key for each entry, right, in the bitmap, which is not efficient. But it wasn't a problem until now because downtime is not really a thing in Cosmos to make it a problem. And afterwards, of course, it's a, it's a cyclic one, so you can just rewrite it. Now, in the case of uh, in the case of Neutron, we have the soft opt out that we didn't want to touch the SDK code, so we implemented just on the interchain security code. So we didn't touch any of this uh, of this uh, code, right? So what happens now? Uh, Neutron has, I think, a window of thirty thousand uh, blocks, which means that they basically write thirty thousand entries. Here they give an example for this of 32,000, so it's similar. <laughs> so they write 32,000 entries and that when the validator actually goes down, you clear that entire set, which means that you go through those entire keys and you clear the, the values, which is, yeah, you iterate over 30,000 uh, entries in a key value store in an end block, or uh, no, actually it's in a big end block. And for Neutron, actually, that's very often because you have a bunch of validators that are allowed to be down because of the soft opt out. So those validators will not be jailed. So that means that, again, every 30,000 blocks, they will go through the same thing. For the last 5% of the voting power, they will iterate over this entire 30,000. And for each validator, you go over other 30,000. Um, and the worst part uh, in this is that. Um, that five, the bottom five percent. If you look at voting powers, it's there are quite a few validators. There are not just one or two. So this is the this is the issue in a nutshell. Uh, there are two ways to. Uh, I'm not sure about that, Jacob. I think uh, so. They fixed it in uh, fifty. So this thing is in main. Uh, and. Uh, it's also backported to zero to the 50 branch. It's uh, I talked already with Marco and they will not backport it to 47 because it's state machine breaking. And it's not really a, it's a refactor, as you can see from the PR's name. It's a refactor that is a breaking state. Um, uh, the go one level down. So if you go one level down, the IAVL fast node, it, it doesn't actually cure the need for the iterators that's causing the performance problem, but it makes the iterations they do way, way faster. Um, that's actually why it was built. I um, If you go back in time, 
you may remember a time when osmosis apox took 20 minutes a shot. The reason for that was actually iterating through the locks and then calculating uh, the rewards. It was a very, very similar situation. So every day there was this one block that would take over 20 minutes to process. Um, the medium length version of, there, there were kind of like two solutions. One, uh, our original validator was like magically immune to this and I couldn't figure out for the longest time why. It turned out that that computer, which I had originally built to be a file coin plotter, that uh, means it had really, really fast hard drives, really crazy fast, right? So the reason that we would complete that block like in a minute, whereas everybody else was taking 20 minutes, was just the amount of IOPS that the machine could process. And then, so that was kind of like problem identification, step one. And problem identification, well, problem solution was actually this IAVL fast node change, um, which dramatically speeds up uh, iterators. So what's required to implement that? Because right, the, the situation right now is we have this fix, but it's not in 47. Uh, the SDK team doesn't want to put it in 47, it seems. Um, no, but so if I understood from what Jack was saying, this is fixed in 46 and 47, right? That's now absolutely correct. What you're saying. There, okay. Okay. Yep. So, what so wait, wait. Know? So it, would it require nothing more than just using 47 is what you're saying, Jacob? Or is there something else that needs some other dependency that needs to be changed? You're, you're correct. If 47 would fix it. Also, if we wanted to make another point release on 10, it could fix it. Um, do you remember, Jihan? It was, oh, I don't know, December or so. And I was talking yeah. to you about an IAVL. No, I remember this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is sort of like, okay, the solution that we have on the screen here, it's better, right? Um, but the IAVL fast node will dramatically speed up uh the yeah this 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 would get dramatically better Many okay times. so if you just need 47 we should have a 40 we should have uh ics v3 with 47 in it out um on i don't know if it's still friday marius but uh relatively soon and 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 neutron uh should be able to upgrade to that version of ics uh and then Wait, we can, we can see what jump, happens let's not jump the gun so i wouldn't well, of course, Neutron can upgrade to that. Maybe it's even better. Yeah. But upgrading and we'll that see, we'll see how it 40, uh, upgrading that entire change for seven may take a bit. Uh, the other thing that they can do, we can do, is to do it in the testnet, right? So once they upgrade yeah. the, the chain to forty-seven and to be able to use interchain security with on forty-seven, uh, what do you think is possible to try to reproduce this? Yeah, does behavior? this happen in testnets? It is happening in testnets. It is okay. Awesome. Yeah, we having we're seeing some performance issues in the testnet. Okay, um, so then we can you... try in the testnet to check if uh, the problem will go away or will be much less at least. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, the the other thing is, I I can write a patch for Neutron. Maybe right now, it's it's a few lines of code to enable this on forty five. So. Let me let me throw to you guys a, a suggested very short term patch for this. Okay. Um, first of all, IAVL fast node, you should, this does not always work. So I, I'm gonna write it, I'm gonna test it on a non-validating node first. Then we can even I, I don't mind if we test it even on our neutron mainnet validator provided that it works on a non-validating node. Um, but like basically, uh, Fastnode is, it, it only affects the node that it's on and won't affect consensus if you configure it right. And- um, So what you'll see, so Jacob, I, if you do this on your node, you'll see your node get through everything really fast and then it's just waiting for everyone else and then you'll know the fix worked. Yeah, yeah, well, there, there's that, but also 
because the issue is these iterators, my confidence level is really, really high that Fastnode, uh, you know, I think over 10x, I, I don't want to like overstate it, like minimum 2x though, uh, faster with the iterators and is, I'd say the fastest solution we've so, got. So mm -hmm. is this consensus breaking? using this fast yeah. node if you did the thing you're talking yeah. about 45 okay so no, potentially you could try it on your good. node you could try it on yep. your node and then say hey guys i sped everything up everyone install this uh you know we could we could do another release i suppose with that stuff uh, 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 a minor uh, a patch release and then basically there would be no need for a coordinated upgrade on neutron it would just solve the problem that's correct um okay and if that not, doesn't work then we go to 47 yeah. with a coordinated upgrade which you know we yeah yeah, we want to do that anyway, cool. and it'll be better. Um, I'll I'll do it like right now. I think I just need to change like one default. Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank thank you. Um, be excited to see how that turns out. Um, I think we've we've covered everything uh, for for now with this, right, Marius? Is there anything else on this new trend downtime thing? We have a bunch of other uh, stuff to too, no it so. seems it seems fine yeah we should move on uh yeah we just have to sync with uh, neutron i don't is there anybody from neutron on the call i guess not uh yeah we have to sync with somebody we from can there and yeah see. we can we can let them know um but exactly. ideally if, if this 45 play? fix works then it's going to be a very easy uh very sure. easy upgrade um for for everyone okay cool i i guess that uh, eventually they will want to move to 47 anyway so eventually but but i think they yeah. don't really have a huge need for it yet so it's probably you know um okay. easier that to do if the sense. 45 thing works okay, okay. so okay. uh then there's yeah yeah okay so uh there's the next thing on the agenda here is the lsm module maintenance arrangements um and uh we've had some discussions with with uh the sdk team and um occlusion and um stride teams and stuff and so um basically the we've been trying to figure out who will well who and where who will maintain and where will the code be hosted um for the lsm module uh, obviously, it's already been accepted by uh, signaling proposal. Um, the the idea of it is 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 widely accepted, but then the question is basically where uh, where does it live? Um, and so it's been developed um, in the occlusion repos. Um, and so we want to avoid. Basically, it's a fork of staking, slashing, and distribution. And you might just want to do a fork of the entire SDK. Um, and so basically, um, you only want to do a fork of the entire SDK. So, so basically the question is, where does that fork live? And um, we don't necessarily want to have it. You don't, you know, we don't want to like fork the SDK and have it live, have a occlusion SDK fork or something. So what we're going to be doing instead is there's going to be a branch in the Cosmos SDK repo in the official repo. Uh, and that's going to be the ICS LSM branch, <laughs> the 45 ICS LSM branch. And um, that will have that will have the changes uh, that are necessary for ICS, which are in 47, but not 45, and then also LSM, um, which are in, in neither. And um, so for the short term, that's where it will will live. It will be maintained. We'll get backported uh, security fixes and um, things like that. Um, and the the teams, ICS, uh, LSM, and SDK teams will collaborate on backporting any fixes that are relating to their respective softwares. Um, and uh, so the um, the end goal here, well, this is a you know temporary. It's a temporary situation, but the uh, end goal here is that um, is that basically we we actually get it. We get it. Uh, kind of rewritten so the staking module can have the liquid staking module be more of kind of a separate module versus a fork of of three other modules um and that that's kind of a long term the long term plan and at that point um that liquid staking module which is kind of the standalone thing may just go into uh the SDK repo directly or maybe it will be in a separate repo uh similar how the interchange security module is is in its own its own repo 
Um, but that's kind of the long-term plan. But for the short term, it's going to be a special branch in the SDK repo, which will be maintained by um, multiple teams. Uh, any are there any questions about that plan? No, my comment there is good. It's good. Like uh, P stake had had been telling us that it was pretty challenging uh, to deal with like the splices, those replacements. I agree with P stake on that. Um, it was so. Here's our LSM experience. It was tough to get IBC working. We eventually did, but like that, that required a lot of fiddling. Um, it was tough to after I oh, and then Cosmwasm. It, it also required its own set of fiddling uh, with the LSM. And those changes, so you know, those have now been merged. So like those, the changes to support IBC. And Wasm, they're in LSM now. Far as I know, there are not additional incompatibilities. Um, but I, I like the plan because really just putting those directly in the SDK until we have the SDK fully modularized is going to be the best and most viable path. Cool. Yeah, um, I, I think one one other thing to follow up on, which um, me and Zucky are following up on, is basically how the LSM interacts with mesh security. So the mesh security folks are writing a Cosmos SDK module, which is kind of an adapter layer. Um, the most logic is in Cosmosm, but um, there are a few capabilities they need to access in Cosmos SDK. Um, and so we're just going to have to make sure um, that that works smoothly with with the LSM. So that's just one more one more thing to to look at, but um, it may also inform a rewrite of the staking module, which which everyone wants to do. Um, kind of looking at two, you know, we have three separate use cases now: modifications, ICS, LSM, and mesh security. And so maybe seeing those three can help you factor it into a shape uh, where it's as adaptable as it needs to be for multiple use cases, but not you know too too over engineered or abstract. Um, so yeah, I'll move on to the next item then. Uh, if there's if there's nothing, uh, another comments on that the. Um, Living roadmap. Um, this one we I think we we published. Uh, I think it was last week. Um, but basically, this is this is kind of um, this is what our team at Informal is going to be working on uh, for you know for it's it's you know kind of twenty twenty three, but generally just more of I would say sort of short to medium term um, stuff that's kind of uh, either you know in the later design phase or just we you know sort of nailing it down or actually being. Um, deployed or implemented. Um, so, so we don't have stuff that's in that are early ideas that are still just ideas or very early specifications. And we also um, will remove stuff we've completed from it. Um, and then also uh, we don't have stuff that's being done by teams outside of informal in this roadmap. Um, there may be a, there, you know, there, there, there may be a call for some kind of roadmap. That's, that's a big roadmap of all, all teams, but this one um, for now is not that um, to keep it simple. Um, so basically, I'll go over the major sections. I guess where we have uh, so twenty more minutes here. Um, so one of them is uh, replicated security improvements. Um, so basically, there's just a bunch of stuff that we kind of wanted to add to it or improve that are really you know core replicated security features, but we just wanted to kind of uh, you know get them in there and get in there for launch. So the onboarding and offboarding. The onboarding is uh, you know currently in in almost ready to deploy. We'll see how it goes on July nineteenth. Uh, and then offboarding, it's kind of the same. Um, obviously, nobody's wanted offboarding yet, um, but uh, basically, that's you know, it's 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 a similar. It will definitely be a different process and different code, but it's it's similar in some ways. So um, that's to let consumer chains decide not to be consumer chains anymore. Smoothly go to their own validator set without breaking IBC for them. Uh, then cryptographic verification of equivocation evidence. That's another thing that's been in progress for a while. Um, We've been we've had it sort of open for a while. We've been dealing with more urgent things, but this basically will allow the first version will allow the um, hub to verify light client attack evidence uh, from consumer chains, and then we'll do something which will also allow it to verify double signing evidence, and that will allow us to completely get rid of the um, the slashing uh, 
like this this the the slash packets that we have right now that are governance gated will just get rid of it completely and it will just be verified right on the um right on the hub this will also be useful for mesh security mesh security wants to do it this way too so uh we'll be able to um you know give them access to this uh this this functionality for mesh security Cryptographic uh, verification of downtime. We've actually um, ended up deciding that it may be better for the short term to just improve the the throttle. Um, so we have a thing that lets that doesn't let consumer chains send too many jailing packets at once. Um, and probably for the short term, just making that a little bit better um, will probably be better than trying to get into the cryptographic verification of downtime, which is a, it's a pretty tough problem. So um, I may actually have to go. It's a good reminder. I should probably change this roadmap a little bit now because there's a living roadmap and uh, kind of update it with our. Our current plans. Um, so, I guess I don't have to get into details on this unless someone's interested. Um, but this will make it so that consumer chains are basically like almost, almost trustless. Um, and um, also on the trustless consumer chain thing, like these the, these things here, these are both kind of related to trustless consumer chains. Uh, there's also uh, many places in the code where a consumer chain could cause it DOS um, that fits within the. Not many places, but a few that fits within the kind of security model we have right now. But once we once we're trying to shoot for a trustless security model, we're going to also want to uh, remove the ability for them to do that. Um, and that's just some you know tweaking tweaking stuff, how things are stored, putting limits in place, and things like that. But uh, once we do that, it should be pretty like a consumer chain. Even if it tried to attack the hub by sending a crap load of jailing packs at once, um, not only will that not succeed in bringing down the hub, it will also uh, just stopping that consumer chain will basically stop the attack. Well, like the validators have to halt and that'll take care of it. Um, halt the consumer chain. Uh, and then epochs. Uh, this one still, I don't think we've really done a huge amount of research into this yet, but the, we may want to make it so you don't have to have a, a packet every single block. Um, it's not every single block, but it's almost every block. And, uh, that's, you know, pretty wasteful. So, um, we're going to try to, uh, make it so that, you know, maybe it's a packet every hour, I don't know, every day. I'm not sure exactly how, um, you know, what the frequency would be, honestly, but um, a lot of the code actually was written for an epoch-based model. We tried to keep it open to working that way, but probably once we change that, uh, it will break some things. Um, so it's it's mostly a matter of, first of all, deciding, you know, what's what's the interval going to be and, and what are the limits on like what's a safe interval and kind of defining that a little bit better and then also uh, just changing the code making sure nothing breaks then we're also working on the future of interchain security um, and I think that replicated security will I think we've gone over a lot of this already actually in the last call so I don't know if I want to um, but I know this is something interesting to people but basically I guess I'll keep it quick uh, the um, you know, replicated security, I think, will always be a compelling option for chains, especially to enter the atom economic zone and sort of get this tight integration with the uh, set of great consumer chains that we're, we're building. Um, but also often security is going to be nice because it will let people start consumer chains. It'll make it so you can put a transaction on the hub saying, hey, I got a consumer chain. And then only some validators can opt in. And so that will be... Um, that will be great because it's almost like permissionless consumer chain and you can right away get like a lot of the security of the cosmos hub right off the bat um without having to worry about um uh you know getting the governance proposal through and stuff um and then also mesh security of course we're collaborating with um with the well collaborating a little bit with the mesh security group um, i've been reviewing reviewing their design and their docs and stuff and, and talking with them about it um and uh, mesh security, I think the, the hub is going to do really well um, with with mesh security because it's got a lot of security to give. Um, and so uh, that's that's another ongoing sort of um, thing we're sort of keeping tabs on and, and helping collaborate with. And then also this may be a little bit further out. This is getting towards being maybe a little bit too far out for the roadmap, actually. But I just wanted to mention it in context of mesh security is that you could have a really cool thing where the hub actually when you start a mesh security chain you like start it on the hub and get a bunch of security right off the gate, right out of the gate, and then add the other, uh, add the other um, uh, mesh security chains to it. And sort of through that, make it kind of like you have a launch platform. You can get launched with pretty good security and then you can kind of expand from there and make it kind of a good user experience for, for chain, teams launching chains, but that's still uh, pretty far out. So. Um, I think that's our, our living roadmap right now. And we're going to keep, uh, you know, we're going to keep updating it. The, the goal is for it not to be kind of like a thing where 
we're saying like this is what's going to happen when you know and then on like february 25th uh mesh security is going to come out or whatever and, you know like it's it's more just like here's what we're what's on our plate right now uh, and we'll just update it as we go um any questions about that no but but i, I have i have actually two compliments so i spoke with the stride team about basically guys like I, I put up the governance proposals and uh so i called aiden aiden you sure it's going to work you described to me the testing that had been done guys very good <laughs> it's really impressive um that that is working kudos and actually the other thing this this permissionless actually Gian, I, I do have a question about making rs permissionless that's one really interesting and two how does that work without a governance proposal how would a new chain step in and leverage the hub security uh without gov well it's it's for opt-in so basically validators can decide for themselves whether they want to validate a given with opt-in security whether they want to validate a given consumer chain so that means that if you put up your, and I'm not sure, we'll have to sort of figure out how the life, life cycle of that looks and, and what the procedure exactly is. Um, but in principle, if you're a consumer chain, you put up a proposal, uh, you put a proposal to be a consumer chain and no validators opt in, like, you know, it hasn't really bothered anybody. Um, and as validators opt in, they make the choice. So the reason you need a governance proposal for replicated security is uh, you need to see whether everybody is okay with running it and getting, you know, jailed for downtime if they don't. Um, but with with opt in, since it is opt in, it's a validator by validator decision. That's what um, you know would make it uh, permit permissionless to to put up. Yeah, I can see that being real popular. Um, nice. That was what we wanted to do originally. That was always the plan for interchange security, even back like two years ago. Um, but the, the problem is we figured out that without fraud proofs, uh, there are some serious problems with that. So um, we kind of focused on replicated security, um, but this actually leads really nicely into the next topic, uh, which is fraud votes. Uh, and I'm about to bring this out on the forum. Um, but basically uh, fraud votes. So, Hmm. Um, how much time we have left here? Okay, we got to twelve minutes left. So this this should be good to at least give a quick overview. Um, basically, what we realized with opt-in security is what if you have a validator? Let's say with opt-in security, only one validator opts in, and you have a or you know twenty validators opt in, but they're all controlled by the same person. You know who knows? Um, you you have this validator. Maybe it's got ten million dollars on the hub stake to it. And so you're like, hey, you know, that's $10 million security. That's pretty good. Well, I mean, that's kind of small, actually, but, you know, let's say it's a uh, 50 million. And so it looks like you got a lot of security. But what if it happens that this validator is malicious? Like, you know, uh, <laughs> the hub maybe has, you know, that's a very small percentage of the hub. Maybe that's a malicious validator. You just don't know. Even if you trust the whole hub's validator set completely, you don't know whether some subset of that set is malicious. That's kind of the. The problem we ran into um and um basically uh it's this is more theoretical stuff a bit basically if you have a whole validator set which is um which like like you know the hubs validator set could easily just take the money out of everybody's wallets um and that you know they could take the money out of everyone, you know they, they could they could do that and they could you know uh, i don't know how much they'd actually be able to get out of the hub before the price crash and stuff but basically they can take everybody's money. Nobody can stop them. Um, the only thing that's, well, there's many things stopping them. There's many factors as, you know, uh, reputation, criminal penalties. Um, there's a bunch of soft societal factors, which lead them not to do this, but also a big one is they have all this money staked and all that money is going to be lost. Even if they prevent a slash from going through or they commit offense that's not slashable, um, people will be like, wow, the Cosmos hub's complete bullshit. You know, they just stole everyone's money and Adam's price is going to crash, basically. So that's that's called token toxicity. And the problem is with opt-in security, if you just have this one validator, this one evil validator, um, maybe the price doesn't crash because maybe people just say, uh, oh, it was just that one validator who stole the money and um, 
you know, uh, it was just that one. And, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's not the whole validator set. Adam's still okay. It's too bad about the consumer chain that got robbed, but you know, it's not really Adam's fault. So you have kind of a, uh, you have a, a dispersion of responsibility and sort of the token toxicity is not really as toxic anymore. Um, and so, and then also is a factor that really that, that one validator's actions is then being the consequence of being borne by the whole, if, even if it is, you know, the price probably would go down, but it's kind of like, you have diffusion of responsibility in, in opt-in security, which you don't have in uh, replicated security because replicated security basically has the same exact security as the provider chain, the Cosmos Hub. So um, I don't know how clear that explanation was, but you can read this, um, I'm gonna have this come out really soon uh, for, for more detail. Mesh security, same thing. I think mesh security is even more diffuse basically because uh, people might not even consider it really um, if, if some evil delegators on osmosis do one of these attacks on some small mesh consumer chain, it may not even really be associated to osmosis that much because people say, oh, it was those consumer chain validators who did this. The delegators on osmosis are innocent, you know? So, um, basically that's, that's the problem is that you're not really, you may be numerically giving it security, but you're not really like, you know, securing anything. And you are securing against double signing because you have the, the double signing verification. So we slash for double signing on the provider chain, but there is no slashing for incorrect execution on the provider chain. So that's the problem. And so what allows you to slash for incorrect execution is fraud proofs, uh, which are also used in rollups. And basically um, what that would do is like you have, let's say you have these evil, this evil hub validator who steals all the money out of this consumer chain using incorrect execution, AKA just like literally running the wrong code that takes all the money out of everyone's wallet, basically uh, not double signing. Um, you have them do this incorrect execution and now they're not getting slashed on the hub. And basically they had $50 million in theory at stake, but it wasn't really at stake. Um, so with fraud proofs, uh, you can slash for that. So fraud proofs basically um, let somebody submit like a, a proof that, um, and th the way they actually work is very complicated, very intense science and stuff to, to make it happen. But, um, basically it proves that a validator didn't run the right code. Um, so you say, you're basically saying that here's the previous block hash, the, basically the, here's the previous state of the blockchain. And then here's what it should have been, um, after the next block with these transactions but here's what the validator said it was. And as you can see, this is wrong. They weren't running the right code to have produced this state. So that's a fraud proof. And that would make opt-in and mesh security secure, except for the fact that fraud proofs like don't work yet. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, and it's, it's the kind of thing where it is a very difficult uh, technical problem. Also, zero knowledge proof would work as well. I'm not going to into the, 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 the distinctions, I guess, between the two, but it's like basically right now, um, even with, with eigenlayers, a similar system, they have, they want to use real fraud proofs, but they actually had to build in a backdoor, which they have in their white paper, uh, for multi-sig, um, because they can't be sure that it will work. So what yeah. I, I wanted to bring up, what I wanted to bring up for discussion here, and then the problem is one, one of the, one of the big, well, just, just to give you an example for validators here is that with a fraud proof, system um anytime naively naively implemented anytime a validator had an app hash error on a chain that would actually generate a proof uh that could slash that validator so that shows you like that's even if you have the proofs working you have that to deal with as well which is the fact that like if anything goes wrong then it can be proved that you incorrectly executed even if you didn't steal any money and it was just maybe even something wrong in the consumer chain's code, some non-determinism, like they're iterating over a map or whatever, um, you know, could result in a bunch of validators getting slashed. Emergency upgrades, technically, with fraud proofs, uh, those should result in a slash because you're running not the right code, not the code that was sort of registered with the provider chain or whatever. So beyond fraud proofs even working, which they kind of don't yet, um, there's also the, the infrastructure around it and how do you, how do you deal with uh, actually running a system that uses fraud proofs that everybody getting slashed, you know, 24 seven. So basically what I wanted to open up for discussion here is the, is, and we'll, we'll be putting this on the forum is the concept of fraud votes. Um, 
So fraud votes, a very, very, very simple, basic concept. It's it's almost a little bit, I don't know if I'd say janky because I think there's there's no huge downside with it, but it's basically a temporary solution. Um, and what it would be is just a governance proposal. And if you're opted into a consumer chain as a validator, uh, you're, you're you know uh, exposed to this, but basically it's a governance proposal where somebody can put in a proposal saying, slash this validator, they did incorrect execution. And they would then with this proposal, they'd submit some proof. Um, that would look like a, um, it could look a lot like a fraud proof. Like they'd say, here's the previous state, here's the uh, next state, here's, here's what happened. Um, here are all the victims who had their money stolen or whatever. And then also kind of, uh, you know, here's where you can sync up a full note to rerun the state. And so we'll give all the voters everything they need to kind of um, see for themselves what happened by running a full node. Um, and this is kind of what a fraud proof, a real fraud proof lets you do in a much more uh, efficient manner with a real fraud proof, but it will also work by people just doing it themselves and voting on it. So it's definitely not as elegant, um, but also it sidesteps a lot of the problems. It sidesteps the, the fact that fraud proofs don't actually work yet because you're not really doing a fraud proof, you're just doing it yourself. It also sidesteps the deployment challenges that I discussed there, which, uh, you know, for the, the, um, the thing where, you know, an emergency upgrade ends up slashing you um, because if validators did an emergency upgrade and somebody tried to say, oh, these guys did an incorrect execution because it's emergency upgrade stuff, then the voters would be like, no, that was an emergency upgrade. That was totally legit, you know? So um, also another thing with fraud proofs I didn't mention is that with fraud proofs, you need a DA layer. So there needs to be a layer like Celestia where all the transactions are posted because otherwise validators could evil validators could basically commit incorrect blocks but never show anyone the transactions that went in and then nobody be able to actually generate a valid fraud proof um so uh da obviously the da layers don't really exist yet celestia is working hard but it's not deployed yet um and then also the other thing is that the security of the da layer actually um limits this so if you use that let's say celestia had a stake of uh, you know, 800 million, but the Cosmos Hub was supposed to be securing stuff with a market cap of two, you know, with a stake of 2 billion, uh, you'd actually be limited to the to the 800 million of Celestia or whatever Celestia's was for using that for DA. So it's kind of another, another little piece of the puzzle there. Fraud votes again, sidestep this because you don't have to worry about the DA because like people can make intelligent decisions. If you see a situation where the validators of a consumer chain are hiding all data from everybody and then producing blocks where a bunch of people say, Hey, my money got stolen. Um, <laughs> you know, you don't need a DA layer to know what happened there. So um, that's uh, that, that's another way to sort of sidestep some of these really tricky challenges that come with fraud proofs. And what it lets us do is, is basically get opt-in security and mesh security going more quickly. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, Oh yeah, Denise, um, I'm going to put this, I think I'll do this today probably, uh, we'll put this on the forum for discussion uh, and, and I'll shoot you a link to it then. Um, or I, can, I, I guess I can get you a link earlier as well, but this is still kind of, uh, here, let me go put the link in the chat yeah. here. I think it's Can, uh, can we get the May update link too? You had a May update, Google Doc, can we get that link too? Um, we're going to, we're going to put that like on the, on the, on the, on the blog post like today, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, so basically, um, that's that's the idea. We're we're sort of like um, we're sort of like you know trading. We're, it's not as elegant, maybe not as you know computationally provable or whatnot, but um, it should work. The other thing I'll say is that this is necessary for mesh security as well. Like I said, and um, I I don't I've spoken with the mesh team like Jake um, and Ethan and stuff about this several times. Uh, they kind of weren't really aware of the problem, I think, um, and. So I don't know, I haven't really spoken about like what their plans would be, but basically I think what they were planning on doing originally was like, you could avoid fraud votes just by YOLOing it and not having fraud votes and just running mesh security anyway. And then if some validators did do incorrect execution, I guess you'd be in a scenario there where you would like have like a real social slashing where you actually like do a migration to like hard fork and like, you know, take those validators money away. Um, but I think that is better not to depend on stuff like that, because that's a pretty yeah, uh, janky scenario to be in. 
it's better if you're going to rely on this mechanism, it's better to have it be in the official process of how things are supposed to be and work without, a, without a hard work. So, so basically, um, I do think that if we, if we don't do this on the hub, uh, I think we'll see, you know, osmosis, Juno, et cetera, either doing this for mesh security or effectively doing this with hard forks for mesh security. And uh, the hub will be saying, oh no, we don't want to do it. It's not all cool and fraud proofy, but then we'll be sort of left behind. So, you know, that's my opinion, but I'm going to put this up for discussion. And uh, then, um, you know, we can kind of see from the community what everyone thinks about it. So, so yeah. One last question. I know we're kind of over time here. Um, mm. Can you just delineate the difference between this like fraud proof light thing that you're describing and the hard fork solution and, and how one isn't exactly as you're saying hard fork light isn't exactly a social slash. And I just want to kind of get my head around that. Oh, I mean, well, the, the term social slashing is very, very vaguely defined, actually. So um, maybe it's not oh, yeah. really something oh, yeah. to use in a concrete definition. But basically, um, uh, if if you didn't have this and you were running mesh security and then through mesh security or de some delegators on your chain attacked a consumer chain and stole the money out of everyone's wallet on the consumer chain, then um, presumably somebody would be, there would, there would have to be an effort to organize a hard fork to say, hey, we got to take these people's money because they just robbed all these guys. Um, and, you know, like that's one of those things where you're assuming, yeah, people would do that. They would make a hard fork happen. And, and so this just provides a governance proposal to do it. So there's a vote and it's not like some sort of you know, oh, backroom oh, hard fork okay. scenario. Right. Yeah. So there, there's an actual gov prop in this gov prop. Yeah, and it follows a process yep. and it's like, you know, it's well regulated. It's not just like some sort of thing like where you're sitting around saying, shit, we got to like hard fork to take these guys money or whatever. And it's like this whole big kerfluffle. So yeah, just trying to make it more yeah, uh, that is organized. That is a much better solution. Definitely. Yeah, but still, uh, uh, still approximately the same thing. I mean, if you if you get down to it, you know, it's kind of the same thing happening, um, but it's just better organized and part of a process and, and everything. Yeah, I, I so I, I I prefer that path a lot because yes, you as we all know, uh, Juno proved you you can pass anything as a signaling prop. Uh, <laughs> that might not be a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and the thing is also a lot of validators might not like it puts it on it puts the onus on the validators to install the software which slashes people and they might not feel like they want to put themselves in a position to sort of uh you know do that without without there being some um you know more more official process that they're following. Uh which with the Juno stuff where they're trying to slash that with the whale, I forget whether that passed or not, but basically a lot of validators were like, no, we're not gonna install that update, you know. So it was a big it was a big, big drama, and and that's like you know not what you want. Um, oh yeah, it was trouble from every angle. Um, yeah, so I, so I definitely prefer to have a gov prop. I'll just make one more note. Also, probably this is really quick, but probably with the, the, these props will go for one week only, um, so that it gets done before. I think it could go either way, but basically you want to be able to kind of get people before they unbond. But I think that's that's fine. That that's maybe a little more nuanced. But with the new SDK stuff, actually, I believe in 47, they now have it so that you can set how long you want the voting period to be when you make the prop, I think. Um, or in any case, it's more customizable than it was before. So uh that should help with that. But another thing I want to make the point about is this actually sort of positions us pretty well against Ethereum and Eigenlayer because these guys have to basically Ethereum has made the explicit design choice that it wants to be governance minimized. And they want to sort of pretend like, you know, they can run the Ethereum chain and not have any opinions about anything. Um, and now I kind of would say that's not really the case. Um, I think that like, obviously, I mean, it's years and years ago now, but the Dow hard fork uh, kind of proved that. Um, but it's it's sort yeah, of like hard to avoid these scenarios. And then like with Eigenlayer, as you see, they're running on this sort of governance minimized base layer of Ethereum, but they don't really have a good way to sort of do governance uh, with Eigenlayer. Um, and maybe you could have everybody who's got money in Eigenlayer have, have a vote, but you get into all kinds of like game theory issues and stuff like that. So um, for now, they just have this multi-sig 
So even though they have fraud proofs, they still have to have a way to cancel fraud proofs because fraud proofs, you know, naively are just going to be slashing everyone all the time. So um, it's kind of like it actually it lets us keep moving and do opt in and mesh security and keep advancing and iterating on the shared security front while Ethereum sits there and tries to like perfect fraud proof. So I think it's it's a competitive um there's a competitive advantage there where we can play to our strengths essentially when one of our strengths is the governance system, which obviously there's a lot of drama, um, but it is governance that works. People have their own opinions, they voice them and, you know, um, versus it not existing at all in Ethereum. So that's kind of the um, way I think about it. I'll put it up on the forum. Um, and uh, once we get some discussion going about it, we might do a signaling prop uh, to see if people if something want people want to officially endorse. Um, and then if it is, then we can start working on opt-in security and uh, make this um, sort of uh, governance proposal type to, to slash people, slash will slash validators who do incorrect execution and have that be part of opt-in security and uh, allow it to work. So, yeah. I would vote, I, I would vote yes and, and support it. it. It's just nice. so much better than what happened with Juno, put it that way. Yeah, the, the thing is to be clear, like there has to be also guidelines around the limits. We do not want to splash validators for random shit. Like it really has to be very clear what it's for. And that's not necessarily something that'd be written in code. It's more of like a constitutional thing. Like this is used for this purpose. It's not used because you don't like a validator or whatever, um, because that's that's a huge that's a huge rabbit hole. Um, one other thing it can't be used for is it can't be used for downtime. Um, that's also, yeah. I think, bad. So Actually, you know, I think as, is intentional, incorrect execution. Exactly. Um, exactly. You, you had a really good point about like, hey, if you're app hashing out, you are doing incorrect execution. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to see the difference. It's, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and another thing is that another thing about Eigenlayer. So one thing I will say is that it's, I, I do not think this should be used to slash people who just had downtime. And so it will be possible for a malicious subset to opt into a consumer chain and then just halt it. Like that's possible. Uh, that can't be stopped. I don't think it should be stopped with a slashing proposal because I think you should be really conservative about what you use these for. Um, and that's actually also, I checked with Eigenlayer and that's also a problem that they have too. So they don't really have a solution to it. But with Eigenlayer, same thing. Their consumer chains are called AVSs. I forget what it stands for, but basically if you have Ethereum delegators that come in and have a majority on AVS, they could just stop it and keep it from doing anything basically uh, with, with, their, with their vote that they're getting um, from their restaking. So that's something I think that'll have to be navigated is the liveness of these systems. Um, and I don't think it, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to use, um, it doesn't make sense to use, to use this kind of thing to punish people for liveness. Um, but yeah. Cool. Um, well, thanks, everybody. Is there any other questions or anything I didn't cover that anybody's interested in? I know we're over time, but... No, that was great. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Thank you for the call. That was good. Okay. All right. <clears throat> cool. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.